to construct a historical synthesis that can explain in a coherent and convincing manner what happened to the Jews of Eastern Europe, Russia, Poland, Ukraine, Galicia, in the World War I, the Russian Revolution, and the Civil War, is no easy task, as I discovered to my great dismay when I was preparing this talk. While the Jewish experience in World War II was dominated by the Holocaust, the Jewish story in World War I is characterized by many intersecting and often paradoxical turns of events. Jews suffered unprecedented violence, and at the same time, they threw themselves into relief and cultural work with amazing energy. Hundreds of thousands of Jews fought in the warring armies, often against each other, and those lucky enough to return, or many of those, came back scarred and transformed by the trauma of the trenches, often unable to return to Jewish traditional observance or even to settle into the pre-war routines of family life. As the writings of I.J. Singer, the brothers Ashkenazi, Shinansky, Churban Galicia, Oyser Varshavsky, the, the uh, Shmuglaris show, the impact of war had a demoralizing effect on large sections of Jewish society upstanding daughters of Balabatisha families turning to prostitution, widespread smuggling, which privileged underworld elements that had those skills. And yet this was also a time of great idealism and sacrifice, as Ansky's own example can attest. And isn't it true that one key theme of the Brothers Ashkenazi, one of my favorite books, is the theme of redemption? that just because of his personal humiliation during the war and the revolution, Max Ashkenazi finally attains a status which had eluded him up to that point, the status of being a mensch, and that Jacob relinquishes his former identity as a happy-go-lucky uh, playboy to put his life on the line and to obtain sublime martyrdom. There are many other paradoxical elements of World War I. The collapse of the Ottoman, Habsburg, and Russian empires meant that millions of Jews now found themselves under new, under new rulers. The Galician Jews who had exchanged their pre-war status in the old multinational Habsburg empire for citizens in the new Polish nation state certainly dis suffered a major decline in, in, in uh, their political and economic situation, not to speak of such terrible outrages as the largely forgotten Lvov pogrom of November 1918. But the plastic moment provided by World War I also made possible the Balfour Declaration, which did not, of course, guarantee a Jewish state, but which proved to be a turning point in the history of the Zionist movement. And furthermore, another result of the mass violence and horror of the Russian Revolution was the Third Aliyah, which helped to consolidate the position of labor Zionism in the Yeshuv. This period also marked a major watershed in the history of American Jewry. The formation of the Joint Distribution Committee during the war not only saved many Jews in Eastern Europe from starvation, it also marked the coming together of old elites and immigrants. It showed that despite deep differences, which continued, American Jewry could find common ground through a philanthropy in helping Jews in need. The war also strengthened calls for the democratization of American Jewish life, exemplified by the movement for an American Jewish Congress. No less important was the realization by Louis Marshall, a major leader of the American Jewish Committee, that rather than ignore the Congress, he would have to really work with it. As Marshall and others understood, like Lucien Wolf, those war years proved to be a major test of Jewish diplomacy. Uh, an example of diplomacy without much power. One of the major aspects of this period was the growing recognition that individual and civil rights alone could not meet the needs of East European Jewry. 
that they needed collective rights, minority rights as well. The lead up to the Minorities Treaty in 1919, occurring against the backdrop of Polish pogroms and Ukrainian pogroms, convinced Louis Marshall and even Lucien Wolf that some additional measure of minority protection was really needed. But the war and its aftermath also exposed the limits of Jewish diplomacy and the ominous extent of Jewish vulnerability. Between 1914 and 1917, French and, Jewish, uh, French and uh, British Jewish leaders especially were all but powerless to protect Russian Jews for the obvious reason that Russia was their country's major ally. And in the fraught negotiations in Versailles in 1918 and 1919, the reality of Polish pogroms clashed with the determination of the French and to a lesser degree of the British and the Americans to establish a strong and viable Polish state. Jews got a minorities treaty, but it fell far short of their hopes. It was aspirational, but in the end, it did little to protect Polish Jewry. So uh, one could easily say that if one does a balance sheet of World War I and the Russian Revolution, the ultimate balance has to be negative. Russian Jewry, the largest Jewish community in the world, was now split among different countries. There was a huge upsurge in anti-Semitism, evidenced by the fact that the American ambassador in Warsaw, the British and the French ambassadors in St. Petersburg and later Petrograd believed the worst slanders about the behavior of uh, Jews. Ignacy Paderewski could say, and people believed him, that the 35 innocent Jewish communal activists in Minsk who were shot in April 1919 by a Polish lieutenant, that they deserved what was coming to them because they were communists. This was a time when, for even a short period, the London Times and an editorial could give credence to the protocols of the elders of Zion. Before 1914, thanks to the efforts of Jacob Schiff, Louis Marshall, and others who joined Poles and Italians in effective lobbying, Jews in the United States could keep the gates open and immigration continued. But this upsurge of anti-Semitism was in no small way a factor in the passage of the 1924 Immigration Act, which transformed modern Jewish history. In, before the war, Schiff and Marshall could try to play hardball with President Taft over the Russian-American uh, trade treaty, which discriminated against American Jews. And in that case, they won. In 1924, President Coolidge would not even take the time to see Louis Marshall. And Jews were powerless to keep uh, the doors to America open. So taken as a whole, the Jews came out of World War I much uh, much weaker. A new international financial system meant that the kind of uh, financial uh, politics which enabled Jacob Schiff to help Japan on the eve of the Russo-Japanese War was much less uh, possible. And I can go on and on. So the measure is largely negative. And of course, these effects, direct and indirect, as I just said, can be uh, read back to the aftermath of the revolution. And as we remember this 100th anniversary, I keep telling myself what someone once told me there, and it's a saying that many of you may have heard since. He said back in Leningrad when I was studying, in this country, the hardest thing to predict is the past. And he turned out to be totally right. And I want to begin with some personal reminiscences not really academic, but sometimes personal memories can be revealing. When I was younger, many, many, many years ago, I spent a lot of time in the former Soviet Union. In the 1970s, I spent two years as an exchange student on IREX, in Leningrad State University and in Moscow State University. This is in the 1970s in my uh, previous life as a historian of Russian civil society and Russian liberalism. 
And everywhere one went, one couldn't help notice unintended irony and even humor. I lived in a dormitory on Vasilevsky Island in Leningrad, and nearby, there were, outside the windows, you could see two large displays. One had huge images of Brezhnev, Kosygin, Podgorny, other members of the Politburo, average age, high 60s at that time. Then a few uh, yards away, a huge banner, Communism et the Molodos Planeti, Communism is the youth of the planet. <laughs> and uh, I remember in the Finland station, they had the wanted posters, Sjesajuzni Rosisk, the and the, the, the criminals that were most wanted in the country and below the faces of hardened criminals, details, peculiar characteristics. And under one poster of a, of a face of a, uh, of a tsua, which you wouldn't want to meet at night, the distinguishing characteristic which would enable you to spot that person was Ochin Fjezhliv Sjedaga Varit Pajasta. He's very, very polite, and he always says, uh, please. So if you hear someone like that, turn them right in. And I remember that it was a great time for anecdotes. One anecdote concerned the 100th anniversary of the revolution, November 7, 2017. Soviet science has reached unprecedented heights and it can now revive the dead. And the Politburo decides to bring Caesar, Hannibal, and Napoleon to watch the centenary parade of Soviet military might. Caesar sees the rockets pass by. If I had those ballistica, I could have smashed the Gauls. Hannibal sees the tanks. If I had those elephants, I would have crushed Rome. Napoleon is paying no attention to the parade. He's reading back issues of Pravda. <laughs> Mon Dieu, if I had these newspapers, no one would have heard of Waterloo. <laughs> yeah. The uh, years I spent in Leningrad also allowed me to witness the beginnings of what would become a profound transformation of Soviet Jewry, that Jews not only in Georgia and Lithuania, but also in Leningrad and Moscow were beginning to apply for exit visas. And in 71, 72, quite a few were actually getting out. And one of the things I remembered as I visited people's homes then was the frequent tension between young people who wanted to leave and parents who weren't ready to leave. Those parents and grandparents had been the generations that had left the shtetls and cities of the former pale for Moscow and for Leningrad. It was because of that generation that in a short time, Soviet Jewry became not only the most educated nationality in the Soviet Union, but I believe proportionally the most educated and professionally accomplished Jewish community in the world. Keep in mind that it was only in 1955 that Soviet Jewry, 1% of the Soviet population, was dislodged from second to third place in the list of Soviet citizens with a higher education rank by nationality. Many of those parents were hard put to understand why the return for the loyalty they'd felt to the Soviet Union was state-sanctioned discrimination that had kept their children out of the best jobs and the best universities, for they themselves had made a kind of unwritten bargain with the Soviet state that echoed the offer made in the French National Assembly during the revolution, to the Jews as a nation, nothing, to the Jews as individuals, everything. They thought they'd kept their side of the bargain. But just as czarist policy towards Jews was marked, by inconsistency and contradiction, at least until the reign of Alexander III, so too did Soviet Jewish policy after 1945 begin to reflect both the growing mistrust of its Jewish citizens and the lack of a really clear sense of what to do with them. Was the reason for that mistrust the fact that there was a Jewish state, that so many Jews had relatives in the U.S. and elsewhere? that because of their foreign contacts, Jews couldn't be re relied upon? Perhaps, that's something we can discuss later. I noticed a certain paradox. 
that what made these young people Jewish, and today they'd be my age, not so young, were markers that had nothing to do with Jewish languages or religious observance. These young Jews, however, st were still different from young Russians, and that difference was evidenced in a distinct subculture, a subethnos, in the words of Natalia Yuchneva, which was defined in part by the fact that it was these Jews that had a special affinity for Russian high culture, and that unlike most Russians, they themselves were not two or three generations removed from the village and from the peasantry. Thankfully, I was not a Soviet citizen, and I could not, I didn't have to put myself in their shoes. I did not have to apply apply for university entrance or jobs. I didn't have a passport with that fifth line. But I distinctly recall one incident in Leningrad in 1972 that suddenly brought these matters home in a very personal way. My, my, my family came from Western Belarusia, former Polish territory taken by the Soviets in 1939. When the Germans came, needless to say, they had a dreadful time. After surviving Einsatzkommando 9 in June 1942, my mother and some of her siblings ended up in different Soviet partisan units. Again, not easy to, to get in, but they got in. My mother was in Szczors, Rokosovsky. Two of my uncles were in Spartak, where they distinguished themselves. And Spartak especially had many Jews. One day in Leningrad, 1972, I saw a book for sale about the Soviet partisan movement in that region of uh, Belarus, Partizani Vileshchini. And there was an appendix which listed each separate unit, its commanders, and its composition by nationality. And each time it was the same. And for Spartak, I'm kind of making up numbers here, so many Russians, 545, so many Belarusians, 472, Ukrainians, 78, Armenians, 5, Uzbeks, 2, Estonians, 1, and then others. And the others were 165. <laughs> and I immediately guessed who these others were. And in this way, a blatant attempt to erase the Jewish presence in what had become the formative experience of Soviet identity World War II suddenly impelled me, at least for a moment, to feel like a Soviet Jew rather than as an outsider. And I was outraged. That angered me much more than having had to hear, as I did once from some half-wit that I ran into, that during the war the Jews were cowards, that they bought their medals uh, on, on, on the black market, that they captured Tashkent without having fired one shot. I could, I could ascri ascribe that to ignorance, but this book showed a deliberate effort at a high level to write the Jews out of Soviet history. Just as in World War I, as 500,000 Jews fought in the Tsar's army, military censorship forbade publishing cases where Jewish soldiers won medals for gal uh, uh, gallantry and even shut down a newspaper devoted to the Jewish role in the war. Now in those days in the 1970s, I never could have foreseen that a time would come when I'd be called on to teach in the JTS project Judaica in Moscow, which David Fishman organized, I think, and which turned out to be a wonderful experience in part because I got to know better David and Shane Orosky, Steve and Zipperstein, who were also teaching there at the same time. We teachers lived in a building that had once housed the Vepesha, the higher party school. And I never would have guessed that to make room for a shipment of Jewish books sent by the JTS, shelves and shelves of communist pabulum and propaganda would be tossed out. And I could not have foreseen that just a few years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there would be an amazing outpouring of scholarship, not just by Russian Jews about Jews, but also a sudden visibility of Jewish questions and Jewish themes in general public uh, scholarship and in general historical discourse. 
As Russia struggled to find a new identity and to reconnect with its tortured history, key questions kept emerging. What ideology will take the place of communism? How can we cope with the loss of empire and great power status? How do we juggle the ethnic, the civic, and the imperial components of Russian identity? Where the hell in our history can we find a usable past? Ivan the Terrible no longer cuts it. And uh, one remarkable feature in that conversation was the attention given to Jews. Uh, there was Alexander Solzhenitsyn's very problematic book about the Russian-Jewish encounter, 200 years together, which was a runaway success. Although as John Clear, uh, may he rest in peace, remark after having read the book, he understood why Solzhenitsyn was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature and not for History. But that book was discussed in great detail. And in an article on that book that appeared in the journal Rodina, the historian Ludmila Gatagova asked, why so many people in post-Soviet Russia were obsessed with the Jewish question? Her answer was that given the Russians' uncertain sense of national identity, and even what she called, and I'm using her words, their ethnic neurosis, the Jewish question will be question number one because the role of Jews in the political, social, and cultural context of Russian history exceeds the role of all other minorities and small peoples. I'm quoting her. By the, by the same token, the prominent social historian Boris Mironov asserted that the Jewish question was especially important because it was a litmus test of whether Russians could really build a society based on civic rather than narrow ethnic national identity. And the journal Ab Imperio posed a question that many Jewish historians like to ask here in the United States. What will it take? When will the day come when serious historians rather than amateurs, novelists, and filmmakers determine popular consciousness and perceptions? Studies and articles also began to appear about Jews in the Russian Revolution. This was obviously a fraught topic. At a time of uncertainty and national humiliation, there were those who idealized the Tsar and the Cossacks, who blamed the Jews for the murder of the royal family, and who insisted that whatever the horrors of the Bolshevik Revolution, it was outsiders, you know who, and not Russians who bore the blame. Serious historians stepped in to present a more balanced picture, all the while re suddenly reversing many decades when the word Jew hardly appeared in Soviet historiography. In 1994, Sergei Alexeyevich uh, uh, Pavluchenko published a study of war communism in which he stated, and I quote, without the Jewish question, there is no history of the revolution. There was no issue of any importance that was not tied to it some way or another. And most important of all are the magisterial works of Oleg Budnitsky. His Jews Between Reds and Whites has been translated into English. It's the single best study of the subject, and obviously I rely on it quite a lot. Now, Budnitsky aptly noted in his conclusion, and I quote, the Jewish question was a central one of the Russian Civil War. As a result of numerous historical and religious stereotypes held by a majority of the population, Jews were destined to become the embodiment of absolute evil, bent on the destruction of uh, Russia. And one of Budnitsky's most revealing conclusions concerns the shameful shift of many members of the cadet party, the pride of the Russian intelligentsia, and long the model of sanity and democratic liberalism, a shift towards anti-Semitism in the face of ongoing Bolshevik uh, triumphs. So what Solzhenitsyn, and Gatagova, and Mironov all have in common is that they accept as a given the Jews' outside role in outsize role in Russian consciousness and in Russian history. Tellingly, Solzhenitsyn's 200 years together includes only two main actors, Russians and Jews. No Armenians, no Uzbeks, Ukrainians only get a cameo role. Now, in a way, this is all very puzzling. Were the Jews that important? Were they that prominent? After all, in 1917, 
The Jews were only a minute, tiny proportion of the Bolshevik party. They were only 4% of the party, only 1,000 Jews. The March Revolution saw an upsurge of Jewish interest in politics, but that support went almost entirely to Jewish parties, Zionist, Bundes, Vereinigte, and the Aguda. Jews played no role in the food riots that sparked the March Revolution. The soldiers who crossed the Rubicon by refusing to fire on crowds in Petrograd in the spring of 1917 were not Jewish. When top Russian generals in Mogilev and Skov told Tsar Nicholas that they would not fight to keep him on the throne, it's safe to say that among those generals there were no Jews. To be sure, many Jews played conspicuous roles in the higher ranks of the Bolshevik party. And of the comrades who returned with Lenin to Petrograd in 1917 on the sealed train, a large number were indeed uh, Jewish. And there's no denying the rapidly escalating anti-Semitism in the summer and fall of 1917. Gorky wrote in Untimely Thoughts, idiocy is a disease that cannot be cured by means of suggestion. This is something to think about now. <laughs> to the... <laughs> You know, to the, to the person suffering from this incurable condition, it's crystal clear. Since there are seven and a half Jews among the Bolsheviks, the Jews are to blame for everything. And then he goes on to say, and after all, this honest and sane Russian will once more begin to feel an alarm and will experience or tormenting shame for his Rus and for the Russian blockhead who in time of trouble immediately looks for an enemy from without instead of the real enemy, which is the depths of his own stupidity. What enabled Lenin to seize power in November 1917, and you all know this, was the support of mostly Russian soldiers and mostly Russian workers in the capital cities. Shortly after the Bolshevik seizure of power, Russian citizens went to vote for the Constituent Assembly. The Bolsheviks got only 25% of the vote, and that was without doubt a Russian vote. Of the 498,000 votes cast for Jewish parties, the Zionists got 60%. And it was thanks to the support of Russian workers, sailors, and soldiers that Lenin could uh, blithely suppress the Constituent Assembly in one day. I don't know who came up with the mordant comment the Trotskys made the revolution and the Bronsteins paid the bill, but whoever came up with that comment was absolutely right. That bill included up to 100,000 Jews killed in about 1,500 pogroms, whose ferocity today is forgotten largely because of the Holocaust. A description of the gruesome tortures inflicted on the Jewish population makes for terrible reading boiled alive, buried alive, eyes gouged out. These pogroms came from all sides. The forces of the Ukrainian directory, the volunteer army, countless semi-anarchic peasant bands, the Poles, and even the Red Army was responsible for 9% of the pogroms. Although in the Red Army, pogrom activity was severely punished, whereas in these other armies, the Nikon and Petlora issued occasional calls to stop the pogroms, but they weren't taken seriously. Now, there had been pogroms in 1881, 1882, 1903, 1905, 1906. Indeed, each wave of pogroms claimed more lives. But these pogroms were different, and that applies especially to those carried out by the volunteer army, by the Dobrovolchskaya Armia. Previous pogroms were largely spontaneous, and quite often Jewish self-defense units could fight back against them. But the pogroms of 1919 were mainly military pogroms, organized from the top and against which Jewish self-defense did not stand a chance. In Praskurov, a band led by Ivan Semesenko killed 1,650 Jews in four hours. And the pogroms of the volunteer army were especially lethal uh, and they couldn't be uh, 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 countered. In 1918, as Budnitsky shows, many Jews supported and even helped to finance the white army. Many Jews believed that they had to support the whites in their fight against the Bolsheviks. But by 1919, most Russian Jews who did not live on Mars 
had come to realize that the Red Army offered them their best chance to stay alive. The pogroms, and not any Jewish affinity for Bolshevism, turned the scales on the Jewish street. Richard Pipes and Orlando Figus, I don't know how to pronounce the name, yeah, uh, stressed that this violence has to be seen in the context of a general breakdown of law and order in Russia. Economic collapse and a co-committant license to plunder, rob, and kill. And they stressed that Jews were not the only victims, which is true. Or to put it in another way, one can think back to Pushkin's famous words, God save us from seeing a Russian revolt, senseless and merciless. Those who plot impossible upheavals among us are either young and do not know our people, or are hard-hearted men who do not care a straw about their own lives or those of others. Notice that Pushkin used the word bunt and not revolutia. A revolutia is at least hopefully a, a purposeful violence in the name of a political goal. Bunt is a paroxysm of anarchic mass violence. That interplay of revolution made in an impoverished war-ravaged country, counter-revolution, spearheaded by elites for whom radical anti-Semitism was their only effective propaganda tool. The whites are not gonna tell the peasants that, that we're fighting so that the landlords could take back your land. And that interplay of that with sheer anarchic violence uh, the Bund that rampaged through an overwhelmingly peasant country that was in fact in the process of becoming de-urbanized, Petrograd lost two-thirds of its population. It's against this background that some historians believe that we, began, that we can begin to understand the Jewish experience during the Russian Revolution. But Peter Kenes and Budnitsky make a subtly different argument, and I think I agree with them that the anti-Semitism of the white army was of a different order of, of magnitude, where the Jews were seen not just as easy prey to loot or, and rob, or even Christ killers deserving of punishment, but they were seen as a malevolent virus out to infect and destroy the Russian nation and indeed Western civilization or world civilization, depending on your politics. And while it would be stretching a point to say that the Nazis got their anti-Semitism from the Russian whites, the Civil War pogroms can indeed be seen as a way station towards the Holocaust. Likewise, one cannot ignore the pre-war and wartime antecedents of anti-Jewish violence. The anti-Jewish violence that flared up as soon as World War I began and that reached unprecedented heights in the Civil War had its roots in escalating tensions which had become increasingly evident before 1914. Taken as a whole, the long 19th century had been a good time for Jews of the United States, Western Europe, Germany, and the Habsburg Empire. Theodor Herzl and Max Nordau begged to differ, of course. They saw the glasses half empty, not, not half full. But most Jews in Western and Central Europe begged to disagree. In Eastern Europe, however, the portents on the eve of World War I were less encouraging. Polish-Jewish relations were rapidly deteriorating, and the major problem was Russia itself. As we all know, not only did Russian Jewry remain unemancipated, but indeed its political position was getting worse. The pogroms of 1905-1906, an avalanche of new legal chicanery that caused many thousands of Jews humiliation and economic ruin. To be sure, there were some Russian bureaucrats that saw the continuation of these disabilities and even the pale of settlement as untenable and even damaging for Russia. Even Peter Stolypin, no great friend of the Jews, saw that in a 1906 memorandum he presented to the Tsar. But Tsar Nicholas rejected Stolypin's recommendations for a relaxation of Russian Jewish policy because just when Russia was becoming a major industrial country, just when enrollment in Russian higher educational institutions hit an all-time high, just when businessmen and industrialists for the first time were creating a viable private sector that, that, that not only 
fueled economic growth, but buttressed the faint beginnings of a new civil society with private philanthropy, museums, parks, and libraries. Just when Russian culture was experiencing its, sil its, its silver age, just at this time, Tsar Nicholas chose to retreat into a hazy, semi-mystical vision of a return to a mythical earlier Muscovite Russia anchored in an alliance of a father czar, a loyal nobility, and an adoring and religious Russian people. And in this vision, Jews could only be harmful outsiders and enemies. And this virulent anti-Semitism became increasingly entrenched in the nobility and in the officer corps. This was a czar who believed in the blood libel and whose wife took her counsel from Rasputin. And this came at a time when Russia needed wise leadership more than ever, because for all the signs of progress I just mentioned, the country also faced serious problems. A peasantry and a working class that knew very little of the civil society aborning in the cities and whose basic outlook still reflected to a large degree a value system born in serfdom. Faced with these problems, Russian Jewry as a whole was showing remarkable resilience on the eve of 1914. First, there was an important safety valve, emigration. Even though because of the natural increase in population, numbers did not decline. Secondly, following the 1905 revolution, a declining interest in politics was counterbalanced, as Jeffrey Weidlinger and Christoph Gaschenschmidt have shown, by a real upsurge of communal involvement, historical societies and th th musical societies, folklore, a determination to improve Jewish affairs on the local level. For all the political division between Zionists, Bundists, Duvnobian Folkes, and prominent liberals like Schlossberg and Maxim Vinaver, what these Jewish leaders all shared, albeit in different ways, was the belief that Jews were a people, a folk, not just a religious group. Dubnov's call to collect historical documents and to ground a new secular Jewish identity in historical consciousness was shared by Maxim Vinaver, a leader of the cadet party who was also known as the Russian Louis Marshall. Russian Jewry would need all the resiliency and energy it could muster to face the unprecedented shocks of World War I. World War I was a major disaster for East European Jewry for seven terrible years, seven years and not four, from 1914 to 1921. Much of the Pale of Settlement, Congress Pole and Galicia was a war zone that saw multiple conflicts between Germans and Austrians against the Russians, between the Poles and the Ukrainians, between the Poles and the Lithuanians, between the Poles and the Bolsheviks, between the whites and the Bolsheviks, between the Bolsheviks and the Ukrainians, and I've not exhausted the list. A city like Vilna changed hands seven times between 1915 and 1922. The fighting burned hundreds of towns, destroyed railways and bridges, spread disease, and caused lasting harm to countless Jewish families who became uprooted and demoralized by the collapse of the pre-war world. The growing anti-Semitism in Russia on the eve of the war was especially rooted in the Russian officer corps. And when war began in 1914, the army assumed control over the war zone. They expelled hundreds of thousands of Jews and wreaked havoc wherever they went. The Russian Council of Ministers was dismayed by the challenge of caring for so many Jewish refugees and was even forced to agree to the de facto abolition of the Pale, where in central Russia, for the first time, Jews and ordinary Russians came into close contact. But for all the protests of certain ministers like Goromikin, the army did not relent. And one should also note that the British and the French ambassadors supported these blanket accusations of espionage and disloyalty against Jews. If there was any bright spot, and coming to the end of my talk now, if there was any bright spot in this uh, bleak picture, it could be found in the Jewish response to disaster. The war unleashed a new upsurge of national energy in Russian Jewry, as Jonathan Frankel, Steve Zipperstein, and others have shown. The war stimulated Jews all over the world to help victims and to defend Jewish interests. 
In Russia, the ECHO poll, the Relief Committee, launched an unprecedented relief effort, which in turn had other far-reaching consequences. New initiatives in schooling and culture, the coming together of activists and the Jewish masses. <coughs> In a city like Vilna, the war saw not only starvation, but the organization of a new Yiddish theater, the Vilna Truppe, and the establishment of secular Yiddish and Hebrew schools. And few efforts at national defense would have more long-term implications than the documentary imperative, the call to collect documents and to write the history of Jewish suffering. World War I and the Russian Civil War would see an unprecedented effort to collect and record what began with the Black Book of Russian Jewry and the Cherikover Pogrom Archive continued with the Oynik Shabbos Archive in uh, the Warsaw Ghetto. And as David Roskies has shown, this Jewish memory of, of, of a disaster fixed in the writings uh, of, of uh, Shin uh, Ansky, you could read this in Gabriel Safran too, in the poetry of Peretz Markish, in this soldier's memoirs of uh, Avram Zak, this had a major impact on Jewish culture going forward. In retrospect, what matters is not only the suffering and bloodshed of those years, but also the Jewish response to these crises. Not all responses were effective, but taken together, they foreshadowed how the Jewish people would emerge from an even greater crisis after World War II. And finally, to end, Soviet Jewry itself. The exodus of Soviet Jewry has created yet another new Jewish diaspora, and its enormous reservoir of human talent has become a major asset for Israel, for the US, and for the Jewish people as a whole. And a new generation of scholars, uh, I can mention uh, 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 Anish Sternsis, Alyssa Bemperad, uh, uh, David uh, Schneer, and uh, others have joined an older generation, Svi Gittelman and uh, Stephen Zipperstein, to make sure that this important legacy of Russian and Soviet Jewry is not forgotten. Thank you. Thank you.